Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz musician, arranger, and leader of the New York-based Nighthawks Orchestra, Vince Giordano. Along with the music, he is a big band historian and collector with more than 60,000 scores in his expansive collection. He's a champion of the 20s and 30s, bringing a whole new trove of audiences into his music that celebrates those decades of jazz glory. He performs with his band called the Nighthawks Orchestra, who have been featured in a huge catalog of TV and film projects, like HBO's Boardwalk Empire and all kinds of Woody Allen films. Vince is a passionate cat that has done very well dedicating his life to the world of jazz music from the mecca of New York City. Get to know him a bit more and dig this interview, my friends. Hey, Joe, how are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? Good, man. Thanks for calling. Hey, thank you for reaching out, and thank you for uh, giving me some of your time today. I appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and start off here, and I know that you're a busy man, but give me an idea of what's been going on lately with you. Lately, we've been involved in two new movies, a Woody Allen film set in the 1930s. It doesn't have a name uh, for it yet. That's how he generally runs, but um, we did about eight numbers for that, and we're, we're on screen, hopefully. <laughs> and then Barry Levinson called us to do a small band version of the Nighthawks, like a quartet for this film uh, about Bernie Madoff, and it stars uh, uh, Robert De Niro, who really looks like him, too. I, I wanted to go over and give him a punch, but, of course, it's <laughs> it's Robert De Niro, and you can't do that. And no. Michelle, uh, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer plays his wife. So we're excited about that. And um, and uh, we've been doing some concerts. Uh, we just did a great concert at the 92nd Street Y, George Gershwin's original Concerto in F, and the Rhapsody in Blue, the original Ferdy Grofay arrangements. And we're still keeping our gig here in New York City at Iguana on Mondays and Tuesday nights. It's a great deal and um, to hear music of the 1920s and 30s and 40s. So let's go back to the lineage of your life here. You were born and raised in Brooklyn, correct? Right. So as a New Yorker through and through, you have just been baptized in the, in the jazz cauldron your whole life. What has it been like to be around that influx of jazz and music for all these years? Well, it's been really great being here based in New York because there's a lot of musicians here. The the, uh, the pool of musicians is endless uh, with the work. There's Broadway uh, shows. There used to be a lot of more recordings. Uh, there is some film soundtrack and, and gigs. So you have people to, to play with. And, of course, going to jazz clubs, we have a good dozen jazz clubs that I like to, to visit when I'm not working. Uh, there's many more. There's small places, little little uh, places we have a, a duo or a trio. It's it's really uh, a great thing to be here. So you started out on the bass sax. Is that the first instrument you were on? No. Actually, it, it was the violin, believe it or not. Okay. Uh, I took a musical aptitude test when I was in the third grade, and I did pretty good. So they said, you can play an instrument. And I said, well, what's available? They said, with strings. And I said, Okay, so let's try the violin. And I did the violin. I didn't have a great time. I had a kind of a terrible teacher, and uh, didn't do anything uh, after after that for like four years. And I actually really started on the tuba because uh, that was the only instrument left <laughs> that they needed. And uh, from there, uh, they needed a string bass player. Then I found out about the bass saxophone. A hard part of of that is to try to find one because <laughs> they're not they're not that that common. You know, you got tenors and altos and baritones. So I got a hold of a, a bass saxophone, and this is back in high school. And I used to cut a lot of classes and have you know, the, the saxophone kids give me lessons on how to play the doggone thing. Let me ask you this: as a kid, when you were growing up. What was what what was your dream when you grew up? To, what, what did you want to do? Was it music or was it something else? No, it was always the music. I mean, I had other jobs, kid jobs. You know, I was a newspaper boy and I worked in a gas station, but I'd always go back to my old recordings. Uh, I was listening to these old recordings, jazz recordings, since I was five, and I was a weird kid. You know, <laughs> none of the kids my age would... Uh, 
relate to this music. They would call it cartoon music, Little Rascals music. I said, come on, this is Fletcher Henderson with Louis Armstrong, or this is Big Spiderbeck, and no, it's all cartoon music. So I had a dream that I'd, I'd love to play this at some point, and um, it was it was a far-fetched dream because um, to put a big band together and uh, get the music and get gigs uh, it was really a pipe dream, but uh, sometimes dreams do come true. Absolutely, and it has for you. And with the Nighthawks since 1976, formerly the New Orleans Nighthawks, talk to me a little bit about this band. It's, it's a labor of love. It's been going on for a long, long time. How did it start? And give me kind of an overview of the history of the band. It actually started by another fellow. Uh, it wasn't the Nighthawks. It was just a kind of a a get-together band, a friend of mine here in New York City who runs a radio show, Rich Connedy, on the big broadcast. He, they, Sunday nights he plays old music. And he wanted to uh, see what he could do with old scores uh, that were in Williams College, the old Paul Whiteman scores, the one that the ones that Bix were on and Bing Crosby and Frankie Trombar. So he got a bunch of these scores, Xeroxes, and tried to assemble a band. And it was really hard because it was... A gigantic band, like maybe 23, 24 performers, and we'd rehearse, and there's no gigs. So I said, well, let's try uh, cutting the band down in half and, and try for like 10, 11 people, because I have arrangements for that. And um, I said, okay, who are we going to get to play these things? Uh, the young people, we were in our 20s at the time, they didn't want to play this stuff. They just said it was old-fashioned. So we started getting musicians who were in the big band era. A fellow like Clarence Hutchinrider, who used to play clarinet uh, with uh, Glenn Gray's band. He played Smoke Rings and all the jazz. He was available. Great. We got Bernie Priven, great trumpet man who worked with uh, Artie Shaw. Uh, you can see him on some of the YouTube videos. We got uh, Jimmy Maxwell, who played with Benny Goodman, wonderful lead trumpet player. Carmen Mastron, who played guitar and arranged for Tommy Dorsey. These guys weren't being called anymore because of age. You know, they were getting up there. I think my youngest guy in the band was uh, uh, of that caliber was like about 78, and I was in my 20s. So it was sort of a preservation hall type band, all these veterans. But they love playing this music. They love getting together and being called again. And that's how it started. And, of course, over the years... Um, sad to say all these musicians have gone to that big bandstand in the sky so I had to replace them and what happened was younger musicians would come in and either like the band or hate the band, whatever <laughs> for playing this style of music and uh, the ones that liked it I took their names and numbers and eventually worked them in So Obviously, the 20s and 30s are your bread and butter. What is so alluring about that time period, the jazz sound that was produced at the time, that's made you committed to that in your jazz career? I think I love the excitement and the spirit, um, the uh, way those musicians and singers worked within these really strict boundaries you had a 78 RPM record that was only three minutes. You had to get a lot of stuff in there. You couldn't go too far out of the box, you know, with, with jazz or melodies. You you pretty much had to stay in a, in a rigid uh, way. But but they uh, really pushed the envelope as, as far as they could. I mean, you have, you know, people like Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington and the early Benny Goodman. They were on fire all the time. And I can go on and on with bands and uh, and this was something that uh, really appealed to me. It, it didn't um, hit me with uh, some some of the later you know pop music that I was experiencing as a young kid. I mean, growing up in the 50s, you had How Much Is That Doggy in the Window and Oh My Papa on, on AM radio. Like, oh man, <laughs> <laughs> this was this was something that really got you going. Yeah. Well, you know. Another thing that's very interesting about the 20s and 30s is the hallmark of that was live music, and you played your share of festivals and venues from the Newport Jazz, uh, the Music Mountain, Litchfield. What is it like for you to climb on stage and do this live? Is this like the ultimate thrill for you? Sure, and it's it's uh, it's very honorable and, and and very scary too. You know, 
there's been so many uh, people that have played uh, on those stages before us. I mean, you just look at the Newport Jazz Festival, like wow. So we got yeah. big shoes to fill. So you know, you're and you're a little scared, you know, because we we're playing older kind of jazz. But I think over the years, uh, people have changed a little bit. It doesn't have to be cutting edge um, with things like Boardwalk Empire that we did for five years and uh, just Wynton Marsalis, you know, preaching that it's okay to like early Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington and Jelly Roll Morton. I said, wow, you know. So you get a lot of that happening and uh, the audience is not uh, uh, as distant as it was when I started back in the 70s. Well, you know, and one thing, too, is I think there's probably a huge population of people in the world that have heard you but may not know who you are. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to ask you, how did you break into TV and film? That's a pretty big soapbox to get your music out. I was lucky. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know, being here in New York, you'd figure film work has to be in California, Los Angeles, and place like that. Uh, many, many years ago, I was in a record store. We had records, LPs, and I ran into Dick Hyman. And I said, are you Dick Hyman? He says, yes. I said, I really appreciate your work and all the great things you're doing. I said, if you ever need a, a fellow who plays lower in- instruments, tuba, string bass, and bass sax, I'd, I'd love to try out for you sometime. I said, fine, give me your card. So I gave him my card, and sure enough, he gets a whole bunch of Woody Allen uh, soundtracks, uh, like Zelig and Purple Rose of Cairo and uh, uh, oh, find, um, I, there's a whole bunch, about a, three or four of them. And he needed someone to play the tuba, the string bass, and the bass sax. So I started to get my feet wet in that area. And as a person, a young person who really loved playing this music and uh, didn't mind bringing all these instruments too. And from there, we did uh, the Cotton Club. I'm thankful for Bob Wilbur for getting us that uh, piece. We're in this little uh, scene with uh, Richard Gere, and uh, he's playing the trumpet, and he's actually playing the cornet, too, believe it or not, in Diane Lane. And uh, so that was another little, you know, little advancement. We did a movie with Madonna uh, called Bloodhounds Over Broadway, which I don't suggest you seeing unless you drink about four cups of coffee because you might fall asleep uh, on the pace. And then uh, we kind of had our stride with uh, The Aviator, uh, working with Scorsese and uh, working with a fellow named Randall Poster. He was the music supervisor, and we did, oh, I guess about eight uh, tunes for them, and um, that went really well. So when uh, Scorsese got uh, involved with uh, Boardwalk Empire and Randall Poster, they said, hey, let's call Vince. You know, he's got the music, and he's got the... Uh, charts and and the band and it was all shot here in Brooklyn which is great because I live in Brooklyn and uh, so I was lucky (laughs) that's wonderful that's wonderful let me ask you about Prairie Home Companion that seems like a real cozy kind of place for a musician to go but were those good times yes and in fact uh, we're playing it this uh, weekend we're uh, taking a bus out to Cleveland and joining Garrison and the troupe it's been a lot of fun. I, I've uh, worked for that show, you know, of course, on most, mostly off and on for over, I don't know, maybe 25 years or so, maybe more. And we do little hits here and then. I, I've showed up either with my bass saxophone and a banjo or the full band or playing string bass. So uh, I never know what, what what part and what piece I'm going to be part of it, but it's always fun. Uh it's it's been a great uh, run for Garrison Keeler. I know he's retiring soon, and uh, he just comes up with all these skits and stories, and uh, ima- his imagination is just wild. He's a great writer. I really take my hat off to him to to hang in that long and to come in with uh, different shows and all the guests who he allows to be on his show and gives them gives us all a wonderful platform to be heard out there by lots and lots of people. And it's a rarity to have that on radio. He is brilliant. He's done some great work. You know, we're so used to multimedia, and it's great when it's the, the radio and you use your imagination with it. So Yeah, those those great stories. I mean, he just gets into it, and 
And if you're just sitting there, you your mind just starts racing and says, "Oh yeah, you know, there's the forest, and oh yeah, there's the old, you know, place where we used to go skating, and uh, whatever he comes up with, you know, it, it's so vivid." that uh, your imagination takes you to an, another place. And that's what used to happen on radio back in the yeah. old days. So you're most definitely a practitioner of the American Songbook. And in 2011, there was a PBS series by Michael Feinstein that, would, that had you profiled in it. What was that experience like? Well, that was really neat. Uh, they, uh, The film crew and Michael came to my house and uh, filmed uh, Michael going through my collection. And we had a little jam session, an impromptu jazz session uh, at my house, too. And Michael's a great uh, a champion of the American Songbook, a wonderful performer, and a great educator. He's uh, he's trying to get a lot of young people into experiencing this great music that uh, all these wonderful composers uh, uh, have uh, given us <laughs> to have fun with. And uh, a great spokesman. He's on the radio. He's constantly touring and uh, uh it was it was really uh, an honor to be uh, involved with him on that on that little series and uh the same folks who who uh recorded him uh Amber Edwards and David Davidson uh also started a little documentary on yours truly if i <laughs> may say so and we're trying to get that uh in the finishing uh touches the, there's a little bit of uh kickstarter money you know that has to be raised and all that. So hopefully that's going to be out in, in my lifetime. <laughs> right on. That's very cool, man. So yeah. along with the music, you're a big pan historian and collector. You have more than 60,000 scores. How did this, um, and, I, and I don't want to call it a hobby, but how did, how did this passion come to fruition? And, and what is that like to collect all of these? How do you get them all? All right. Well, it's it's a passion. It's a, it's a hobby. It's my work. You know, it's all combined in one. So it's it's a lot of fun. It started off simply by going into an antique shop one time, and I ran into some sheet music, which we see all the time. And then there were some scores, and I said, "What's this?" You know, and it was a tune like I don't know, "My Blue Heaven," and there were parts. You know, I was I was in maybe. 13 or 14 years old, and uh, I'd never saw this before. Here's the trumpet part, here's some saxophone parts, and and I said, hmm, so you have to have a band to play this tune. And I said, this is great, so maybe there's more of this out there. So uh, at that time, I was in the union, and I started advertising uh, in the musician's paper here in New York City, and also the one that went to everyone all over the country, wanted old scores from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and I loved my name. And I was just flooded with old-time musicians who were out of the business, guys that were in 70, 80, even 90 years old. And all of a sudden, these boxes started coming in, and uh, some collections were better than others. And uh, I also cleaned out three movie theaters, one in St. Louis that I was there for, I don't know, three weeks. There was over 900 boxes of music. Uh, I went through another uh, collection up in... Um, uh, Buffalo, New York, Shays Buffalo. They had uh, just a giant storage uh, area of scores, and they said we don't use these anymore. Make us an offer. I also uh, this sounds a little this sounds a little uh, maybe you know a little dark, but uh, it worked <laughs> when uh, uh, when folks passed away here in New York City in the musicians union. Uh, I would write a letter to the family of that person saying that I was a young musician and uh uh I'm very sorry and but if there's any chance that you have some old music scores that would uh, possibly be sold at some point please keep me in mind and again people would say wow we have no use for this please come and take this away or make us an offer or you're too late we threw it all out or it's worth a million dollars so you'd get the whole gamut of what people thought about this music. <laughs> so I started, you know, just collecting and filing. Every every piece of music here has an envelope and a catalog number. Originally it was on 3 by 5 cards, and now it's in my computer with backed up. And uh, people said, why don't you scan it? I said, scan it. I'll be here for another 62 years or something. <laughs> and then the, the house next door uh, became available, and uh, 
we share a driveway. So I bought the house and started filling that up with more. And not only is the 60,000 uh, music scores uh, for band, I also have about 35,000 pieces of sheet music and piano rolls and uh, records and uh, pictures of bands, thousands of pictures of old bands that I collected over the years. That's wonderful, man. <laughs> um, let, let me ask you this. Not only with the music and being a historian, there's so many facets to you, but you're also an actor. You were in the Boardwalk Empire. What, what is it like to act? Is it is it a passion or is it kind of an offshoot of the music? What is that like for you? Well, acting is is not as glamorous as people think it is. It's it's a lot of hard work. You've got to get there early in the morning. Sometimes these shoots start at six thirty in the mo- in the morning, and you got to be there and you got to get into your costume. A lot of times it's vintage uh, clothing, and uh, a lot of times you have crazy makeup, you know, that you have to wear, and they cut your hair really short and slick it down with this stuff that takes a week to, to wash out. <laughs> and then there's a lot of waiting around. You you don't know when your scene is going to be uh, shot, so you just wait and wait and wait. Like the first three years of Boardwalk, we were up in this balcony, and uh, we're in these 1919-1920 woolen tuxedos, and the stage lights and the people smoking and all this the heat we're just dying up there you know heat rises yeah. <laughs> yeah. so you're just you're just uh you know being a part of this film a small piece of course we didn't really play live we recorded our stuff in the in the studio and then they would play it back through these uh little pieces that they put in your ears like little earphones they call them earwigs so that you're able to synchronize with the music but you have to be silent because they're they're trying to capture all the dialogue and what's going on in the real part of the film. We were making believe we're playing. And sometimes that's trying. Some musicians that I've used for these uh, uh, scenes, they don't feel like they like to do it after a couple of times. I said, come on, you're being part of the film, you're part of history. Nah, they don't want to do it. So, all right, so I had to find other musicians who didn't mind working under those conditions. Well, and I guess as a karmic retribution for all the sweat that you had to go through, you got a Grammy for Best Compilation for Visual Media for Boardwalk Empire. What was that award like? That was wonderful. Um, of course, I had no idea that it was up. They Nobody told me the studio submitted that. And when the news came in, I just fell out of my chair. <laughs> and, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's great, great getting the Grammy, but even greater... I'm just happy that the music got such a high profile and so many people uh, through Boardwalk and and the award are aware of this great music that that was out there, the the early jazz and early pop uh, tunes and people like Eddie Cantor and Sophie Tucker and George M. Cohan and, you know, some of the people that we've saluted in that series and some of the blues that uh, Margot B. sang so it's really exciting. It it just uh, turned on a lot of young people, as we used to say back in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. So you have gone through so many periods of your life of, of creativity. What would you say is one of more your more profound periods of creativity in your timeline? I don't know if there's been really one time, um, because it's it's been an up and down. You know, the, the music business is something that, it doesn't always build, you know. You, you get a couple of great hits, and and you're you know you're up top of the ladder, and then mm-hmm. two months later you're back in the basement, like uh, in the darkness, uh, you know, because that's just the way it is. I mean, actors and musicians um, touring and, and 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 making pop music and all that stuff. It's uh, I, I think it's it's just been just been great to be involved and doing as much as that I that I can and the, the high profile that we got with with filming and uh and radio shows and uh and recording. It's all been great, you know. You you mentioned earlier on in the interview about one of your teachers that really didn't click with you, but for somebody that has had such a long career and such good things have happened, you've obviously had good teachers. Who would you say has taught you the most about music in your life? I was a fellow named Bill Chalice. Bill Chalice was a man uh, who started arranging for the Gene Goldkett Band. 
and uh, became good friends with Big Spider back and Frankie Trumbauer. And then Lee later went on to, to work with Paul Whiteman and work with those two fellas and uh, the early Bing Crosby, like back in the 20s, and jazz fellas like Joe Venuti and Eddie Lang. And then he went on to the Casaloma Band. He worked with Fletcher Henderson, making arrangements, and on and on and on. He taught me a lot about not only about music, but about the music business and people. And I mean, I was this young teenage kid. I was 16 or 17, 17 years old, taking these lessons from him. And uh, and he was in the 70s, and and he'd gone through a lot of uh, ups and downs, and a lot of great musicians, a lot of crazy musicians, and deals and and deals that have, that 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 fell through. So, uh, so Bill Chalice, uh, said, you know, you can just go through life and say, well, that's good enough. That's close enough. And, but people really remember if you do a good job and it's worth, worth the effort to, to hang in there. He said he sometimes would spend half a night just working on an arrangement, just the final four or eight measures and I said why this well the people are going to remember you and that's that's how you're going to get your next work and you get a good reputation and um you really got to put the work in and that was a great work work ethic and uh, it's it seemed to work thank you Mr. Chalice <laughs> <laughs> so who would you say I know there's many many musicians that you admire that you would consider heroes but if you could whittle the list down to a group of musicians that have probably had the most profound impact on the way that you approach your music, who would you say those would be? Oh, man, that's really hard, Joe. I mean, I, I you know, if I say this and people say, oh, he didn't mention this, this, and this, and this, right. I could go on forever and ever. I mean, of course, Louis Armstrong and Bix Beiderbeck. I love the singing Ethel Waters. She's my favorite singer. Duke Ellington, Bing Crosby. I mean, Adrian Rolini. <laughs> it just goes on, and the same with with songwriters. Uh, there's so many out there who have given us so much to revisit and uh, and and learn. And listening to those old records, you 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 uh, you just can't stop learning from them. They they really were pioneers. They uh, started this whole idea of of jazz and uh and the freedom of, of 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 jazz and singing and interpretation that just influenced so many people around the world they really changed the world so from those wondrous decades of the 20s 30s and 40s with all the live performances that have gone on if you could go back and view one who would you want to see and where would you go uh, again it's a hard question a couple of i mean i'd, I'd love to be at Roseland Ballroom with uh, the Battle of Fletcher Henderson and the Gene Goldkett Band. Yeah. I would love to be at the uh, Aeolian Hall concert to see the Rhapsody in Blue for the first time, or the Benny Goodman concert at Carnegie Hall. Yeah. Or just uptown in Harlem, you know, and uh, watching some of these great bands and people dancing. It's uh, <laughs> it's endless. Don't, yeah. don't get me started. I'll, right. I, I, I fantasize about this stuff before I go to sleep. <laughs> so let me ask you this. As a man that has dedicated your life not only to performing the music of jazz, but preserving it and being a champion of this art form, tell me why do you love jazz? I love jazz because it uh, it just get, gets me in a, in a better place, gets everyone in a better place mentally when we play uh, at our club's or a concert, people come up and say, you know, I came in here earlier this evening. Eh, I was kind of feeling blah. I didn't feel too motivated, but I made the effort. And now I, I'm coming out of here on, on a cloud. And uh, the idea of this music and uh, and the feeling that it that it uh, gives to people, um, it just it's it's you know one of the many things that I like about jazz, of course. The creativity of it, the the, the surprise of it. Uh, you get a musician or a singer. You don't know where they're going with with it. Sometimes, you know, when they take a little chorus, um, 
Now, a lot of our choruses uh, are, are transcribed. You know, we we pay homage to uh, Louis and, and Benny Goodman and Bix and on and on and on, Jelly Roll Morton, because I'd like to recapture some of that and recapture some of that glory so that young people can hear these notes played today live. And then hopefully they'll go out and go back to the record and check it out. Yeah. So this era of the 20s and 30s, do you think as we go on way, way years and decades down in the future, do you think there's going to be a resurgence of this music? Do you think there's always going to be an homage to it? What do you see as the future of our historical data, so to speak, of this era? Well, I think right now we, we're having a real renaissance of music of the 1920s and 30s and the jazz music and pop music with the, the films and stuff. I mean, even, I mean, this is crazy, but the Big Apple Circus, you know, their theme this year is, is the 1920s. Uh, it was a very optimistic time. Uh, you know, the jazz age, the 1920s, was a time when jazz was really popular music. And that's really great. Uh you know, jazz is, sometimes isn't doing so well. You know, when you look at the, the uh, I don't know what you call it, the the little graphs and stuff. You know, of course, rock and pop, and and then you have this and this and this, and, and classical and jazz is kind of down at the bottom there. But you know, but I think it's 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 coming back a little bit, and uh, people are maybe a little tired of some of the stuff that's being churned out as uh, <clears throat> music these days, sounds, uh, <laughs> all this electronic stuff that's kind of generated by machines and not by people. Um, so I I just hope that somebody out there will uh, take this idea that I'm going to lay on them right now and, and, and get jazz and classical music and American popular song exposed to kids when they're really young, like kindergarten age, maybe yeah. some kind of Muppet or Sesame Street, you know, have a Louis Armstrong character and a Benny Goodman character with some young kids, you know, playing around, playing with them or, and just teach them, you know, and, and expose them so that later on these young people as adults will have something that they could relate to. So, oh, I remember that. I remember that trombone or that clarinet or that lady singing. It's just a again another pipe dream. I, I've tried to interest people in it, but maybe someone listening here will uh, grab that idea and make a a million dollars, and they'll buy me a cup of coffee or something like that. I don't <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> That'd be glorious. Uh, let me ask you this: this is my final question. When this biography about you was made, and the masses get to see who you are and what you contributed to the world of not only jazz but to music, what what do you hope that the audience takes away from who you are, your legacy, your work, your life. Well, I I just hope they they can see how hard it is to do this in 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 today's world. Uh, you've got a lot of challenges, you know, uh, to keep it to keep it going, you know, to to keep interest in it, to get the word out, to get the musicians to play it. It's just a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but it's, it's all worth it. But uh, I think they'll see what a struggle it is. It's most people just say, "Well, the music just comes out and there it goes." But th there's a lot of the the uh, the background and uh, how it all comes together. Um, yeah. I I just hope they can check that out and and then you know hear us and enjoy uh, our performance and 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 see the the folks that we're playing for and and how much they're having fun too. Vince, thank you for your time. It's been fascinating. I appreciate you opening up and giving me some of your uh, your world, so to speak. I think the listeners are going to dig it quite a bit. I hope so, Joe. Thanks. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Vince for keeping that spirit of jazz alive and very well in the world. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, or you can visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things neon jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.